first time that they discussed about computer was in 1991 in the Southern Connecticut State University where they introduced this, this session in the conference about computer ethics. In 1994, in the UK, in Europe, this team arrived in uh, Europe via the De Montfort University. We have the pleasure and the honor to have with us the first professor of computer ethics in uh, this uh, uh, 1994. Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Simon Rogerson, Professor Emeritus at the Center for Computing and Social Responsibility at the Montfort University and Chair of Council of the Institute of Management of Information Systems. He will speak, his speech will be Participative Learning Delivers Computer Ethics, How to Prepare Future Computer Professionals. Simon, 40 minutes.
Okay, right. In the audience, somebody tell me what sort of information is collected by. by. Over there. Are, are you students over there? Is this funny over here, students? Okay, so so you, so come on, you tell me what sort sort of information is collect, collected by, by, about you. A piece of information. Can, can you speak up, please?
talks about big data in a very interesting way. It says um, a big data a, a big data may be as important to business and, and and then in brackets and society as the internet has become. Why? Because more data may lead to accurate analyses, <coughs> which may lead to more confident decision making, which in better decisions means greater operational efficiencies, cost reductions, and reduced risk. And that is SAS, who is, is, is a leader in business analytics, software and services, and one of the largest independent vendors in business intelligence in the world. And just think about that for a moment. And there's a problem with that. Because look at the focus. Now, I'm not saying that that focus is wrong. I'm just saying it's not comprehensive. It's not the whole picture, because it's an issue of balance. Where are... It misses out things like society, the environment, people, people who are directly and indirectly in, in, involved, affected by such, such data collection. It is typical of an industry, and it is a problem that, that we need, need our, our future computer professionals to recognise and understand. We used to be in a society which tried to collect data that we need to know. The technology has moved us forward which means that we're now in a society which collects data, which, which is nice to know, just in case we need it. And that is a real problem in terms of each and every one of us. And that's the sort of thing that future computer professionals like the band over there, and it's those, these sorts of issues that people like that need to know about so that when they go out into industry, they ask the awkward questions which relate to society. They are demanding of that. Which leads nicely to, to this, this um, two issues. The first one is to do with this, what I call an ICT trinity, relationship trinity. There are three sorts of group, there are three groups involved in ICT. There are the vendors, the people who, who, who sell, sell software, there are the developers who are, well, let me go back to my paper. Um, who, 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 who develop the systems and are those who receive the outcomes of those systems. This relationship trinity is, has to be based on one thing and one thing only. And that is trust. If this is going to work, it has to be based on trust. And, and, and that is in terms of developers, which in terms of um, the infrastructure and the applications, and the recipients who are directly or indirectly involved, um, in, involved or, or received from, from a particular system which is <coughs> That is really important. We need to understand that. Um, the more pervasive ICT becomes, the more important this trustworthy relationship trinity is. <coughs> And that's the sort of thing that we should include, and that's the sort of thing we should promote as a fundamental aim in terms of whatever syllabus we, we, we develop for, for, our, for our future, for, for in, in our courses. The second thing to do is with timelines. Okay, here's a t point in time, and, and we have a situation where, where we are, um, we have a piece of, a, a, an ICT system which is developed, and at that point in time, we have some ethics and social norms in existence, we have some existing law. And typical, typical ICT industry, um, we, 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 we will not stop there. And so, so at that point in time, people start to think about that system, there may well be issues, issues raised, and so, 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 the, so the ethics community and social impact community start to think about those systems and think about the impact of those. And then it may well be that we need some law which, which, which to, to actually ensure that this, this piece of technology is used, used appropriately. And you can suddenly start to see that it takes a lot of time for, for, for the law to be in place and the, and the, the, the thinking to be, to be developed. But time moves on. Time waits for no man, particularly in the IT industry. And by the, time, by the time that first piece of law is in place, the ICT industry is onto its third generation of, of, of this technology. So the issue is, is, well, 
We've got misaligned timelines. Misaligned time There's a lag between the thinking, the ethics, and, and the law. And you end up with huge policy vacuums in place. And the question is, is the law that's on the statute books, by the time you get to, to the third generation of ICT, is it still appropriate? And the chances are it isn't. And this is a real problem. And this is the sort of problem that, that all um, the next generations of, of, of computer professionals need to understand. This challenge will always exist. This is the biggest challenge for the computer industry that I see. It, because the timelines are, are, are misaligned. Technology moves quicker than all the, all the thinking and all the, 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 the regulation. So, so it has to be the professionals who start to address these issues. That is why you need a, 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 an appropriate curriculum. And the underlying thing is, is about this stuff, fit for purpose systems. I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on that. Apart from the design for all, the idea of one solution is no solution, which is a, a move away from tra traditional view in the, in the industry, which is one solution fits all, which is wrong. It should be understood that one solution is no solution, and we need to we need to have that underlying underlying aim to instill in future computer professionals. So how do we do that? Over the last 20 years, um, I've been involved in developing a, a tool set for practitioners um, to address such issues. And it's been a very interesting journey. It's been an association between academia, including myself, and, and professional associations, for example, in the UK, BCS and IMIS, um, in America, ACM and IEEE, and in Australia, ACS. So these are the, professional, the big professional bodies which relate to the industry. And, and a range of tool sets, uh, uh, tools have been developed, which are very much practically oriented. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to, to go through all those in a lot of detail, but I'm going to just share with you and try and get you to think about using some of these things, just three of them. Um, product process, service, and professional code of ethics. But let's go to the first tool set. In, in actually um, working in the ICT industry, there's fundamentally three things, three phases. You decide upon what you need to, to develop, you develop that thing, and then you deliver it. And surrounding that, that cycle is a whole set of interrelated, complex, interrelated ethical and social issues which need to be addressed properly and need to be continually revisited as you go through that cycle. And the way you can do that is thinking in, in, about that in two, in two separate ways. The first is, is the bit about doing ICT. So this, could, this is concerned with the activities of ICT professionals when, on, when actually undertaking this, this, this cycle. So the aim is, is so that, that ICT professionals will be virtuous in Aristotelian terms. In other words, the professional knows that an action is the right thing to do under the circumstances and does it for the right motive. Doing it for the right motive that is as important as actually understanding what is the right thing to do. And there are, there are ways that you can actually promote that, that, that concept of virtuous action. The education training bit, which is our focus today. Um, and then the idea of having ha, ha, the way you design things, using things like participatory design, having effective governance, governance um, policies in place, and then on an individual basis, using con, con, uh, looking at conduct, um, and professional bodies have their own codes of conduct, um, which should be used in a proactive way, rather than just sitting on the shelf as some glossy, glossy document to say we've got them. And, and, and so there are different ways you can do that. There is the idea of product. So, 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 so the, the outcome of, of professional ICT in there <coughs> is a product. It's a hardware, it's a software, a combination of, of, of both. And you can embed within there those things, ethical values. So you've got a whole range of application areas. 
you've got a whole range of evolving technologies, things like robotics, cloud computing, all those sorts of things. And it's about trying to understand what the potential impact is on all those, those different people, the, the society at large, individuals, the environment, and trying to embed into those products the acceptable social norms, the ethical values, which you can do um, if you think about it. All right, so let me give you an example of that. Um, I'm sure all of you are into music. I don't know whether you can actually, actually see there, but, but on, that, on that landscape, there will be your kind of music, your genre. And I don't understand some of these things, but I'm sure that lot over there will understand many of the things which I have no idea that they mean because they're all a bit, a bit modern. Uh, but there's a whole range of music. And, and this is about a case study to do with music, which I was involved in. And it's all about a piece of music technology. Using music to actually address a really important social issue. Um, and it's about um, trying to develop a system for young people, 11 to 17, <coughs> with, with one, at least one of these things. Social um, or emotional disorder, um, le a learning disability, or, or they, were, they, were uh, they were from the immigrant population with little host language skill. Okay, so, so that's that they were just trying to address this, this, these sorts of people in the community. And the idea being that what they were trying to do was to reduce the risk of marginalisation and social exclusion. And the existing research shows that an early competence in music um, helps you to develop language skills, improves socialisation, stabilises emotion, enhances intellectual, cap intellectual capability. And so on the basis of that, um, this project that I was involved in um, was about trying to develop a, a non-traditional music education using a, a wireless handheld computer which generated music, composition, instruments, song sheets, and playback, in, in, and, and provided group interaction um, online, face to face. And it had individual learning plans, so, so it was it was a community-based piece of technology, but also individual. And it was built upon the, the idea that if you can, you can use music to actually in, get people involved in the community, which is a really neat project to, to, to actually come up with. Okay, think about the process and product. Can anybody give me some, some ethical issues on the basis of side of process and product that you think are important to that particular project on the basis of the spec that I've just given you? Anybody think of anything? No? Okay. Whole host of things, and, and here's just, just, just a few. On the, inform, uh, on the process side, informed consent because the people who are involved, things like we're talking about getting involved with children, so there is a whole issue of, of ethical issues in terms of the process, building this system, doing ICT about working with children. That is a big issue. Um, Things like stigmatism. So here we're talking about the idea of of the way this 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 is is promoted and, and, and the way you actually engage with the with the um, the community to actually develop this system should be done in a way whereby it doesn't promote the idea that you're here because you are somebody who is socially. Um, socially incompetent, okay, and so you have to be very sensitive in the way that you actually you actually um, engage with the people who are actually going to use these systems, um, and, and, and that ties in with the idea of image. So the image and symbols and logos which portray, portray the nature of such a project um, should be chosen very carefully to, to, involve, to avoid any implied meaning. Which is to do which is which is which is of exclusivity or patronisation. So suddenly you've got some very different softer softer issues, as well as building the technology 
that you need to take, to take into account in terms of the process, the way you actually do this thing. And then in terms of the product, what the final thing that's delivered, well clearly image is important because you don't want any, any images which suggest stigmatism, um, clearly. Um, you need to have something which is accessible to all these sorts of people. So this idea of one solution is fit for all doesn't work. So, so there are a whole host of issues which sort of lays out a very different development agenda than the one that you would traditionally do by actually trying to build a bit of, bit of technology. So that's the sort of thing you can do. And, and, and how we've done this in, in, um, in, yeah, with students, how we've used this tool to actually um, engage with students is that we've, you can find lots and lots of tender documents, and these are just five, which I found. And so you can give student tasks. The idea is to actually look at the spec of the tender and then discuss in groups the potential ethical issues and then split into process and product complete the ethics checklist, and then share that with the group at large. I've done this in large groups, where students have gone in breakout groups, and then, and then, then they come together and share those things. So they've teased, teased out from that tender document what are the ethical issues that need to be considered. And that works very well, because it's about trying to build a system, and, and software engineers and computer scientists would engage with that, while well, do engage with that. Second tool, second uh, tool in, in the tool set, for example, which I'm going to talk about. Um, the traditional view in terms of actually developing systems is, is you develop the system, you get some feedback, um, you're reactive because what you do is, if the system fails, then you try and figure out why it's failed. And, and the problem is, is it's too late, it's very costly then to actually fix that system and actually move forward to the next generation. A different way and quite a revolutionary way is to actually engage with feed-forward analysis, which is proactive. So the idea here is, is that you're trying to trying to be trying to forewarn what the problem is before you actually develop something. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to promote success. And I and a, a colleague, Don Gotterbarn, developed a, something called the Software Development Impact Statement Process, which which is a, what, a feed forward system for software engineers. You, you, fat, you, you, you lock it into the software engineering development processes. It sits alongside that. It's very practical. Um, and the idea is that, that you look at all the stakeholders and you try and figure out what the problems are in terms of process, how you actually build the system and the product itself. Are there problems with the product itself? So go, it fits this process product type ID. And it's now available as a, a we, we gave this thing, thing to a software house and they, 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 this is now available um, to be bought as, 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 a, as, a, as a software package for, for industry. And, and various parts of the world are using this um, in their soft, software development processes. In terms of a student exercise, um, one of the things you can do is you can run a, a service lab, computer lab, whereby um, one of the things that I've done is, is I, I developed a, a, um, a fictitious company based on, on, on a real company, a, a chemical company, and the idea that they were go they, they're going to introduce a, a production, a, a, a chemical production control system. And what the students have to do is that they have to do a service analysis on this and they tease out what the problems are, and they always find loads and loads of problems. But the important thing is, is that this idea of technologies talking to other people, so what they have to do as a student exercise is they have to develop a report, a presentation for the board of directors, so they have to communicate in non-technical speak about these issues. And software engineering and computer science students find that very difficult, understandably, um, because of their education, um, their education, diet of education. And that is a really good way to actually start to get the student to think about um, the practicalities of this. Um, the third example is to do with a code of conduct. In 19, let me just get the date right. In 1998, um, I was involved in, in developing for the ACM and IEEE um, 
Computer Society, the Software Engineering Code of Ethics and Professional Practice. And I'm pleased to say there is an Italian translation of this. So, so, so you can use this in here. Um, and, and it's quite unusual in, in terms of codes of conduct because there's a preamble which explains how you can use a code of conduct in a proactive way. Then, then there are two, two levels, levels of code. And I've just shown you the short version. You can, you can, you can, there's, a, there's a URL which shows you where you can find this, this code. Now let's talk. If you, if you go through a code of conduct with students, line by line, they go to sleep after the second line. And I, if I was listening, I would go to sleep after the second line. So, but these, these tools are really valuable and very important and incredibly powerful if they're used in a proper way. So the way that I, I do this is um, we, we pre present a scenario and then what you do is you get the students to actually use the code of conduct to actually then see if there are any things that this, that's happening in this development process which are violating the, any of the ethical principles of the code. And so the question then is, is well, is it okay for that, for that violation to take place? And if not, why not? Or if it is, why, why is that so? And, and also, um, having looked at the thing, if they've come up with some, some issues which, and well, this is a real problem with this, with this scenario, are the things that are missing in the code that need to be included? And I have to say, when we've done these sorts of things in the past, some really clever software engineers have come up with some really interesting additions to this code that we should include, because they know the technology, they're now thinking in a different sort of way, and they're coming up with issues in terms of principles of the way you should actually develop systems, the idea. So that's really important. So, and then you can wrap this thing up with, with, with an ask yourself questions. And, and if you just look at those very briefly, um, though, those who are philosophers in, in, the, in, the, in the audience will recognise that they are actually back. Those, those are, are, are philosophical, philosophical uh, uh, type statements, which are turned into something which is more accessible to software engineers and computer scientists. Okay. Student-led activities and a whole range of things. You know, we've got to move to the idea that we are participative and there are loads of ways that you can actually do that. Let me share with you very briefly just two. Um, because you can do these breakout group type exercises and I've tried to share with you a couple of those now. But there are some more formal things you can do where you actually give the, give the course to the students. One of the things which, which I have done in the past is actually do a formal debate where the students take, take over the course for two, two, two weeks and they run a formal debate. And, and that helps them improve their critical thinking, their public speaking skills, it helps them to actually work together. And these are the typical sorts of things that we would debate. This house believes in, it, it is acceptable to force online services on those who prefer offline interaction with governments or who are technophobes. And they'll debate that and you'll split the, the, the student body into two halves one, one, one is for the motion, one is against the motion. So regardless of whether they, they personally agree with it, they have to actually develop an argument for both sides and debate it. And then they vote. And the students love this. They, they really love to engage with that. Um, and again, what you, you may or may not have noticed is that actually these three, these three um, debate topics um, are really based on three heavyweights in terms of ethics. Um, Benson, Aristotle and Kant. That those those are those are those are three. So you can start to build in build in some of these things. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, right. Alright, the third the, the second second idea is that um, a few years ago I ran a I ran a summer school in, in at the Technical University of Gdańsk where I I um, delivered uh, and it was on computer ethics for uh, computer science and software engineering master's students and, and the, the things in colour, the, the headlines, those, that's the diet that we included and we got the students at the end of the course 
we did a round service lab and they, they, they did a presentation about that, but they also ran for a whole day that they gave presentations on these sorts of, and then chose these, these issues related to the subjects that we had discussed during, during the summer school. And the students ran a seminar and they engaged with that and they asked each other questions. And it was student-led and the students started to take ownership. Why are those things important? Well, it's about participative learning leading to an experimental, experiential journey of maturity. What you need to do is you need to move from tutor-led to student-led. You need to move from gut feeling and anecdote, which is where you start from because we all do ethics, to, to a position where you've given them the tools so that they can then justify a position with a rigorous, with a rigorous, with a rigorous argument. And that's the sorts of things you can do, the way you actually, actually deliver this. Um, somebody said it much better than I do in terms of this. And it's, tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, involve me and I understand. Which is why you need to have participative learning. Okay. Let me sum up. There are future computer professionals who do care, and I'll give you two examples of this. Some years ago, um, a software engineer um, graduated, and about a year or so, 18 months later, he, he contacted me, and he was working at the company, needed some help and advice, and he actually whistled them. Because he was concerned, his eyes had been opened, he'd actually engaged with the module, and he actually found some, some bad practice in the company, and actually, as a young, as a young professional, he went out and changed that company, which I thought was unbelievably impressive. And I was really pleased about that. The other one, um, just before I, I gave up my permanent post, was knocked on my door, and a, and a computer professional who I had taught 10 years before um, came and he said, I want to shake your hand. I said, well, okay, fine. And he said, what I found was that the technical, the technical diet that I've been given has long been superseded because technology has, has moved forward. But what you covered in, in these sorts of modules, I have kept for my working life because it has given me the, the foundation on which to actually be a professional. And I thought that was quite amazing that, that somebody 10 years on was still adhering to these sorts of issues. So, so there are good people out there. There are always going to be miscreants, um, and for that we need legislation. But there are lots of technologists who are in technological clouds, and it's those who, for whatever reason, are indifferent to these sorts of broader issues, which are the ones that we need to address. It's more or less the whole industry. Um, but I have a sense that we're going backwards. Why? Um, because there are not so many headline grabbing failures because IT, IT failures no longer sell newspapers. Um, I think there is an interesting pressure from politics, media and the public, nevertheless, which has meant that we've moved to a, to a situation where, where we have tick box compliance. A regulatory body will put out a checklist, I, uh, industrialists and technologists We'll go to that, that checklist, they'll tick it and say, we've now done the ethics. So all you have is tick box compliance. You don't have reflection and thinking about these more serious issues, which is really important. Um, ethics has become mainstream. Um, there's less and less of transdisciplinarity. We've moved into silence, which I think is a real problem. And, and because the world is not black and white, the world is grey, all, the, all, the, all the, the disciplines need to come together to actually ensure that, that ICT is, is okay. And the complexity of the new technologies, it's becoming even harder to comprehend what the implications are. And there's also a sense of transparency. You look around this room and there'll be bits of technology almost hidden. And so they're quite transparent and for that reason it's quite difficult to find those. To, to, to actually get a handle on what's wrong. Um, and, and there's certainly less emphasis, particularly in the technological areas, in, in certain universities in the UK and other places. We need a new set of champions with ICT backgrounds to help us with this. This is not just a place where 
sociologists and philosophers can look in, into, into the IT profession and, 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 and say, this is what you should be doing. It has to be champions from within our profession, within our industry, who help to actually make these things happen. So, so I think we have the wherewithal to build fit for purpose ethically sound systems by design, but I worry that it still remains by accident. That is why I, we need to educate our future generations of, profession, of professionals in a way that gives them practical skills to address these complex issues. I firmly believe that, this, that the education should be based on a varied diet of particip participatory learning delivered by those who have a practical understanding of ICT. Thank you very much. Discussion and the questions from the audience uh, for Simon. I have a question for you, Simon. <laughs> uh, the, you, you were talking about introducing this with the participatory approach teaching. Um, how was introduced in the UK this uh, kind of uh, subject? Okay, um, the, the model in, 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 in I mean, I've, I've done this for the last 20 odd years, and, and, and the model that we, that we have in, in, um, in, in my university is that we have large group sessions which are, which are normally called lectures, which I hate. Um, two hour sessions and what those those are are, are large group group sessions where, where the students will will be given exercises and I, and I shared and I shared with you two, two things that are, that are actually examples of things that I do in large groups. I mean, we're talking about a group of hundred students which you can you can you can actually interact with in a large group. Split them into into small small plus plus groups, get them to feedback, get them to come down, get them to deliver things. And they don't like that to start off with. Um, but soon they get used to this thing and they become confident. Now when you think about it, I mean one of the, one of the important things about technology is that technologists need to speak to other people. So if they've got a confidence that they can actually speak to large groups, which is in a safe environment, then when they go out into industry, they will be able to communicate some very difficult subjects um, in, in a comprehensive way. So, so we have large group, group type exercises. Um, a large group of participative sessions. Um, we also have um, one hour sessions which are smaller groups and the, and the way that that works is that um, they're not mini lectures which quite often happens in universities that, that, that tutorials suddenly become mini lectures which, is, which I, I abhor and totally disagree with and so what you do is you set, set, um, you set students challenges so for example one of the things you can do is have case scenarios and you give them, they, you give them an, an, an ethic, ethics and ethical analysis tool um, so that they can actually unpack the thing and start to develop, prepare that beforehand and then start to discuss what those ethical issues are. And they'll do that and they'll come to the conclusions themselves. Because the thing that you need to do is you need to get the students to work out for themselves what the problems are rather than you tell them. Because that won't work and they will not want to know that. You know, I'm conscious here today we've got a seminar where, where everybody will just be sitting listening. You know, and I try to get you to interact, with, probably too early in the morning, it's probably a bit scary. Um, but the idea of me, you know, us up here talking to you lot for a day about something which needs to be interactive, I find, I find bizarre and probably problematic. Thank you. One question. Uh, thank you. you mentioned that the case of Moses Contact, taking, uh, taking the case of ACM. No? Anyway, uh, we at NICA, as we said before, we intend to prepare some sort of code of conduct for the new profession, ICT or digital profession. What is your real opinion about the effectiveness of the code of conduct? 
in case uh, maybe the code of, code of conduct can, could be made only some paper without impact on real professionals, or maybe it could be together with some other actions to be taken in order to check from time to time the capacity to apply the code of conduct in, the, in your uh, professional life. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I think there, is, there, there are at least two roles that a, a, a code has value in. One is that, that if, if, the industry, if we're going to be a, prof a profession, then we need to have such some means of redress. And, and so you can actually use a code so that you can identify if somebody has done something wrong in, the, in terms of building a system, developing a system or whatever, then you can use a code to identify from the professional point of view what they've done wrong, which will then give you the, the wherewithal through existing law or whatever to actually take some action. And what, you as, what, what a professional body should then do also is to actually strip that person of their, 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 their professional membership. A number of professional bodies have started to go down that road and in industry and stood back. So, so it needs it needs some some courage from the professional bodies to actually use it in that way. Um, the second way is, is which is what I, I, I talked in, in, in my in my presentation with is that um, you can use it in a very positive way if you build a code a code of conduct into into software engineering practices and the way you actually teach it to 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 your your students and so you use it as a a you use it as a, as, as a way of, of of promoting good practice and of getting them to think in those lines um, in my view there are two two sorts of co codes of practice codes of conduct there's, there's one which I call um, the bookend codes of conduct, which are nice and glossy, that, that, that they're developed in a nice bound place, and people can say, we do it, we've got a code of conduct, we comply, we, we do adhere to this, and therefore we are a good company, we are good software engineers, we are, we are good computer scientists, and that is rubbish, that is wrong. What I want to see is a code, that, that copy, all bound and battered and tatty, because it has clearly been taken off the bookshelf and been used, and people have used it as a, as a, as a, as a way of actually thinking about what they should do. Um, I don't know whether you, 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 looked, you, you were able to, to see the, the, uh, the lines of, of, of the, the first level of the, of the software engineering code, but the first thing it says is, our duty to the public is paramount. Now, if you just simply think about that as a computer professional, a software engineer, that radically changes the way that every computer professional and software engineer will operate worldwide. Because it doesn't put the company, it doesn't put the, your paymaster as, as being the priority, it puts the public. <coughs> and as a professional, that's what you should do. Question? Well, thank you for your speech. It was really interesting. I'd like to know your opinion about how important is uh, open source and free software uh, in this panorama. I mean, if it's worth to fight for their inclusion in the industry or it's uh, a lost battle. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, having asked the question, thank you for that. Very, very interesting. Um, I mean, as you've asked that question, you've obviously you, you know that. There's a long history of open source software and, and a growing growing history of open source hardware. Um, and and um, my view is is that um, when, when you look at the things that have been developed, um, because they self-regulate, then they are more likely to be more acceptable. Because there are you know for every. Uh, person working in the open source source area who is perhaps not got the right motivations, there will be orders of magnitude more who have got the right motivations and will actually fix the things that that single person would would have um, would have wanted to see would have wanted to see implemented. And so um, I mean and if you look at look at the um, 
so some of the, uh, the the reports and documentations and commentaries from, from the open source movement. If you look at look at them, that they are they are heavily um, heavily uh, impregnated with computer ethics type statements. So, so they they are and they have become really um, implied champions of, of, of the computer ethics movement. And so so I, I am wholly in support of open source open source type, type, type promotion. Thank you for the question. I think we can go to the coffee break. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> uh, we have uh, 20 minutes of the coffee break, just at sound.